tell us a bit about the incident, the seeds of, of the ideas for that album. Where did they come from? Well, as I said, uh, the incident for me was basically all about setting myself a goal. And the goal was, this time you're going to create a continuum a musical continuum, a musical journey. You're going to start at the beginning in much the same way that somebody would write a book. Now, the interesting thing about writing a book is it's very different to the way normally that, that musicians write music. Musicians or songwriters will write 10 songs, 12 songs or whatever, and then they'll find a way, you know, a sequence that kind of sounds logical and put them together on an album. That's not the way uh, someone would write a book. A, a novelist starts at the beginning... I think most novelists anyway, start at the beginning and work through in a kind of narrative, linear way to the end. It's very unusual to do that musically, but this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to try and write a piece of music in the way that a novelist would write a novel. Start at chapter one and allow the ideas from chapter one to kind of flow through into chapter two, etc., etc. And that was difficult because um, sometimes it's hard to, to keep that sense of flow and to not disappear up a cul-de-sac and I've actually tried it a few times over the years and, and failed and, and this is the first time I feel I've really succeeded in, in creating that musical novel if you like. So getting back to your question, I didn't have any idea of lyrics or, or, or subject matter at all and I was quite happy about that to start with because as I say in the past that's been very influential on the music and I wanted the music this time to be somehow the most important thing. So I wrote about 30 minutes of music without having any idea at all what I wanted to write about. And then one evening I was driving home from the studio, having been working on some music, and I, I got stuck in a traffic jam on the motorway. All the cars slowed down. And I saw a sign above the road saying, Police Incident. And it's probably the sort of thing that I'd seen you know, many, many times before and not thought anything about it. But for whatever reason, that day, I started to dwell on this word, incident. What does that mean, incident? It's one of those words that actually doesn't tell you anything. And I, and I really couldn't understand what this word was trying to tell me. And as I was driving through uh, this traffic jam, I realised that this incident was a very serious car accident, presumably fatal car accident. And I started to think it's, very, it's a very kind of cold, detached word for something very tragic and very horrific. And I suppose I was kind of struck by that, that at that moment I was struck by that paradox, that contradiction of the very cold, detached word, dispassionate word, incident, and the horror and the tragedy of what it referred to. And I started to notice how often that we use language like this, particularly in the media, how often the news and the media programs use words like incident to relate horrific, horrific things. And at the same time, they're quite capable of, of, um, of doing the opposite. For example, when Michael Jackson died, that wasn't an incident. That was the opposite. That was almost like we were expected to feel like a member of our own family had died. And I just thought, this is absurd. Absolutely absurd. It's the death of one pop star. And yet they can relate things like the death of 5,000 people in an, in an earthquake or a tsunami as an incident. And we're expected to feel nothing, or at least we're not expected to feel anything, I should say. So it really, for me, it began to gestate this idea of how language is used and how very often we rely on the media to tell us what we're supposed to feel empathy for, uh, what we're supposed to feel in a way. And there's something, and I, at the same time that I understand why the world is like that, and that we cannot be walking around feeling empathy for every person in every tragic situation. At the same time I understand that, I also have to accept that there's something quite sick and twisted about that. And it's at the basis of, you know, the human psyche, I suppose. So we're very selective about what we, what we choose to empathise and relate to. So the incident really became about trying to um, take, taking these news stories and trying to 
put back, if you like, some of the empathy that I felt was missing from them, or that I was missing. And that very naturally led me on to writing about all sorts of other things, autobiographical and otherwise, and incidents in my own life that I think had changed the path of my life. Everything from the day I decided to become a, you know, a professional musician um, to the first day I heard Pink Floyd which was a, a life-changing moment, you know. And just these little moments in my life. And sometimes they're moments that aren't significant in themselves. You'd think, you know, maybe the first day of school would be a more significant thing. And when I actually look back at my life, it's not those things that are the most important to me. It's things that are almost insignificant that are the most crystallised in my mind. Just, you know, like a, a, a summer afternoon spent gazing up at the clouds. It's forever in my memory. And yet my first day at school I have no, no memory of. So the memory, you know, how the memory is quite selective and how incidents are crystallised in our mind in sometimes quite strange and unexpected ways.